our featured poet tonight. Um, just I have a few words to say about her. So I had the privilege of being in uh, one of Monica Lee's classes a few years ago in a seminar course. And uh, her passion for the poetry that we were studying, which was Blake and Shelley, uh, is, was absolutely infectious. And I greatly enjoyed that class. So I should have suspected then that this professor who used to bring a, a thermos of tea for the class to share, I should have suspected that she was a poet, but I actually didn't find out until after the class had ended, which was kind of sad, made me sad a little bit, but uh, we could have talked shop, but that's okay. Um, it makes sense though. Um, if you haven't had a chance, I do encourage you to go onto our Facebook page and read her interview with Kevin. Um, it's some of the most wonderful things I've ever read, actually. Uh, very resonant imagery. Um, it's almost a poem in itself. And I, I'd actually like to share just an image that, that Monica used, if that's all right. Um, she describes poetry as a garden. And she says, the poet is a gardener who has a garden at the back of her property. Some people will occasionally see that garden, and it's gratifying if they admire it. But while she's gardening, all she thinks about is the soil, the spacing, the light, the colors, the textures of the plants. For someone like me, who, uh, for whom writing has always been more of a personal than professional or uh, publication kind of endeavor, uh, that re image really resonated with me. So I just wanted to share that with the room. And uh, it's such a wonderful privilege to have you here tonight to close our season on a high note. So I'd like to invite everyone to join me in welcoming Monica Lee. Thank you, Donna. That was a wonderful introduction, and I'm really happy to see so many of you here tonight on a beautiful June evening, and especially those of you whom I know. Uh, I'm going to be reading some poems that I haven't performed before, and uh, I'm going to uh, be mentioning a couple of people that are in the audience that are connected to a couple of these poems. but. I also want to thank Sharon for playing such beautiful, original music that she composes herself. She has such a beautiful voice and so much talent. I really appreciate you coming here tonight and performing. So after I'm done, be sure to listen to Sharon. She's quite incredible. Okay, so the first poem is called May, and in a normal year, it actually describes the month of May. But this year, it's really a little closer to June because everything's so far behind. So I chose it to start off because uh, the world that we see around us right now is, is in this poem. May. We pull ourselves away from the sipping, slippering, hungering throat. Into lucent May, we abandon cells and solitary jails, for lawns with fluffs of gold, air of silken filigree. Renounce torpor and choose tender pink magnolia Eyes are windows of magnolia and cherry blossom. Let's forget we are palms. While the spring-fed pond calls me away, whispers my name in such tones that if a pond can breathe, I believe it is in love. So, um, some of you over there know that poem because you were involved in the uh, revision process. I have uh, three wonderful members of a poets group I belong to who, who were, you probably remember that one. Do you remember that one, John? Yeah. Okay, the next one is for the creative writing students table because four of my phenomenal creative writing students from Western are here tonight and they're really talented and they're gonna read at the open mic, so. Make sure you stay tuned for that. And two of them were in a fourth year seminar I taught, and they will recognize the illusions in this poem. It's called The Little Book. I took the little book from the angel's hand, and I consumed it. I ate the little book. The angel, with the rainbow on his head, laughed and said to me, you ate the little book. 
the seven thunders faded and seven candles fell. The laughing angel, turning pink, then red, white, yellow, and blue, gave me to understand that my belly would be sore from book eating. But the book was sweet like honey. In the beginning was the word, and the word was flesh. Face of sun and legs of fire, the prophecies transpire. Say the word, now say the word, sang out my angel crier. I'm really excited that my father, who's 83, made it all the way from Hamilton to come and hear me tonight. And he's right there, and he deserves a hand of applause because he just won a Lifetime Achievement Award for the Arts by the city of Hamilton. So. And this next poem was first published by Prairie Journal, and it appeared in my book, Gravity Loves the Body. And it was written about an experience I had with my father and my daughter when we all went together to Morocco. So I'm reading it partly um, because he's here and because I hope it will recall some fun memories. Marrakesh. The Medina teams with antics. Souks and mules press against us. Tajines and sheep heads sizzle in an unreal light. Jars of live scorpions are sold. Some come with their own exorcist. Fire eaters, dancers, and magicians throw us through the streets like flames. I am lost in the hungering. If we take some of your mint tea, sweetened to excess, will you let us go? Release us to the palmery, or free us to the desert. Their scorpions are not jarred. The wild cradled dunes are magician and exorcist. This next poem uh, appeared in Montreal's creative, uh, sorry, Scrivener Creative Review. Prison as guest house. Hot rooms hide from the sun. A curtain films her crescent eye whose window sees at once a beaming and a sorrow. Living here bears down as noonday sun on secrets such as my roof, your door, her simple screened-in porch. To escape the dwelling where hinges do not budge, the lock secure, the curtain lifts Screening, baking, peeling. We conjure earthquakes and raise the roof. So this next poem uh, won a prize from Poetry London last year, which was kind of neat. It's called Art. The walls of our house are blank, but in my mind, they are covered. There is a watercolor of a stream that knows its sounds. There are female and male nudes in separate parts of the house. The male looks strong in pen and ink. The female ecstatic in bronze. There is a photographic collage in black and white and gray. Snippets of urban scenes spliced with milkweed seeds aloft. There are pots in swirls of color, reds, oranges, greens and blues, next to tiny charcoal drawings of a farm, chickens smaller than shavings. Brazilian and Moroccan masks flank tiles of engraved instruments, a cello, a sax, and a kazoo. On one wall, a Persian carpet and a mandolin, a mural oil painting, and a waterfall in a glass case. And there is a dream, too, inside an ephemeral frame, barely visible, often faint, shifting, never still. How many people here like Alice Munro? Yes. You can hardly nowadays admit to not liking Alice Munro. It would be kind of awkward. But, <laughs> but uh, I was rereading 
as a lot of people I know are right now, <laughs> rereading Alice Munro. And uh, I wrote a poem that's a little atypical. I hope it sounds a bit like an Alice Munro short story, although it's a lyric poem, but here it is. It's uh, inspired by Alice Munro. It's called I Cannot Tell. A woman inside a body, reticent. A man behind a woman, solid, seeming. A story behind the man and woman, a sentence not said, a letter undelivered, meaning missing. A spot of water would show through, quiet as water in a pot. A bridge, a lens, a page, a town, a marsh, a room. Surgical precision, forensic vision. Mirror in mirror, the image sharp and clear, or hazy and lost. I cannot tell. This poem was published in Bound Contemporary Poetry. It's, um, actually, I'll give you the context. You know, there's this game called Who Knew, and it has these little cards that have nouns on them. And part of the game is you're supposed to pick your favorites of these random nouns that represent things. And uh, I live in a very indecisive family, very smart people, but smart people are sometimes indecisive. And so we were playing this game, and afterwards I came up with this. The game is simple. You guess each other's favorite things from among these words on yellow cards. Bats, or trucks, or corn on the cob. The game is simple. Pickles are ahead of long hair if they're dill and it's not my hair. Pickles are ahead of long hair if they're dill and it's not my hair. They rank after breakfast in bed if food is served on pottery with a lone carnation on the tray. With raspberries, homemade eggs, freshly squeezed bread, and free run orange juice. <laughs> the game is simple. If you don't think about it. Bagpipes outstrip barbecuing by a mile if outside and the day is not hot. Black is better than most perfume, but if you comb a cinnamon stick through your hair for scent or rub your hands with dried orange peels, does that count? The game is not always simple. Everything has a context. Snowball fights far exceed cotton candy unless the boys from West Flamborough Public School are in any way involved. <laughs> then I'd rather have thick gobs of pink sticky stuff. <laughs> the game is not simple. It relies on memory. Between a speedboat and a turtleneck, I draw a blank. Since speedboats can be fun, but pollute the lake. And breasts squeeze warmly against the polyester as they itch. Oysters or crafts? Making crafts. Better than eating raw oysters, but smoked oysters, preferable to buying crafts. <laughs> You're not playing right. She leaves the room. <laughs> the game is simple again. It's over. You have to choose. You have to choose. You have to choose. Okay, two more, both short. This one is called The Law of Dream. There is a law, and it is the law of dream. In its bounds, the mind is feral and raw, like an open sore. And it is a law to rule the universe. Fear and desire supplant us. Fog and frailty invite me back to I love, though I cannot find your face, can't see it at all. For this is the law. It is the law of dream. And then I'm ending tonight with um, 
the title poem of a book I'm working on. It was published in uh, Consciousness Literature and the Arts, and the poem is called Kalachakra. Kalachakra, I have walked your distances, the universe, have found no spinning orb of rock, no more the sun-bleached retina of ice, a blue-gray circle, a waiting iris, rainbow lost, an ever-dilated consciousness, packed and shored against the tide-worn sands. Thank you. Thank you.